Professor Wilford Riley is a former corporate executive who now teaches political science at Kentucky State. He holds a law degree and is a successful author with titles like Taboo, Ten Facts You Can't Talk About, and Hate Crime Hoax to his credit. Dr. Riley, kind enough to once again accept an invitation to join us here at KUSI. Good morning, Dr. Riley. Good morning. Great to be here. Well, you know, I discovered you on uh, YouTube, but uh, it wasn't until I followed you on Twitter that I became a big fan. I recommend everyone follow you at, it's at Will, W-I-L, only one L, underscore, da, underscore, beast, Will the Beast. I'm going to tell you right now, Dr. Riley, if you had an easier uh, Twitter feed, I could get a lot more followers for you. The handle's well, hard. A lot, of people, a lot of people recognize that handle by this point. I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm at about 20,000 on Twitter, but obviously more always welcome. All right. Well, uh, it was one of your tweets that I wanted to talk about, because obviously with the Supreme Court vacancy, you referred to uh, a specific attitudinal model that can predict a Supreme Court justice's vote based on their political views. Could you please explain that for me? Sure. I think that a lot of people say things when they talk about the Supreme Court, like, well, we just want those boys to interpret the law. We don't want them to make the law. That's a bit simplistic. Uh, in political science, we do use that term attitudinal model, which refers to the fact that if you know the political party that a justice is affiliated with, are they uh, are they a pachyderm, a Republican? Are they a Democrat? You can predict about 80 percent of the votes that they're going to make. And if you throw in a couple other variables like age and race, you can predict more than that. But the attitudinal model looks basically at politics, and it's a huge predictor of what these guys do. <laughs> you, you must have an, a dog there. Yeah, sorry about that. I've got a, I've got a little dog. It's a great animal. You might actually get to see it. Well, I, I hope so. Uh, but, okay, so going, you said at 50% of the time on the tweet, but then you upped it uh, in the comments section to 90% of the time. I would bring up the example of uh, Justice Roberts, uh, appointed by Republicans, supposedly on the conservative portion of the court, and yet he's repeatedly been the deciding vote in a number of 5-4 decisions that have gone against the Republican in the White House. There are some exceptions. I mean, people would also point to Breyer, for example. But I mean, on the other hand, you've got Scalia, Thomas, uh, Sotomayor, Kagan. And that, that's why it's 80 percent and not 100 percent. But the simple fact is that it is fairly predictive when you look at something like an abortion case, when you look at something like a business regulation case, what a justice is going to do based on their partisan background. And that, frankly, is why it's such a big deal who gets to appoint justices to the Supreme Court. Um, I think that when you get through kind of the moral discussion about what the McConnell rule means in off-year election years and so on, obviously the Republicans are going to try to push through a pretty conservative justice this time around. Obviously the Democrats are going to oppose that with a frenzy. And the reason for that is that they believe they know what the justice is going to do. And again, the large majority of the time, they are probably correct. Uh, Clarence Thomas is not going to issue a pro-choice ruling ever. Okay. Being that we're having kind of this justice conversation, if I said to you at the heart of the unrest in our society right now is the perceived legal or the injustice in the legal system, that there's a justice system for white folks and there's a justice system for black folks, how would you respond to that? Well, I, th I think that you might be substituting rich folks for white folks there. I mean, I understand you're just asking a hypothetical, but I mean, I live in Appalachia and I don't see an extraordinary amount of white privilege as you drive by trailer parks and coal mines, active coal mines and that sort of thing. I, I looked at this once when I was in graduate school, actually. There's a database called Judici in Illinois that looks at the outcome of pretty much every court case in the state, certainly in the bigger counties. And I looked at the impact of race and sex and age, being from out of town, a dozen other things, on whether you won or lost the case, basically. Race didn't have any impact if you adjusted for one other variable, and that's whether you had a private paid attorney. What you find when you look at a lot of these situations is that African Americans, because of oppression in the past, are less likely to be upper class, are less likely to have those resources. But if you are a white guy standing in court in a torn Metallica t-shirt, you are not going to necessarily be treated especially well just because of your race. Also, there's another very strong predictor variable. Are you guilty or not? Uh, most people that are in court as repeat offenders are there for a reason. And that's going to affect how the judge treats you. Prior record is one of the most predictive things in any quote unquote models like this, as it should be. Uh, you're, you're involved in the 1776 United uh, get together, right? I mean, your name's on that, correct? 
Yeah, I'm actually, without false modesty, I'm one of the founders of 1776 Unites, which you can find at 1776unites.com. Explain what that is. Yeah. Uh, To some extent, it's the black business and social science community's response to the 1619 Project. But more broadly, it's an integrated attempt to provide a positive, aspirational view of America in terms of high school curriculum, materials for young men and women, so on. Uh, Bob Woodson, I will shout out, quote unquote, as the original founder. You've got Glenn Lowry involved, Clarence Page, John McWhorter, Carol Swain. It's quite a lineup. But when you hear things like the true founding of America was in the racial clashes of 1619, I think it's important that there be an alternative where people say, no, it wasn't. The true founding was in 1776 when we all threw off the British yoke with our 10 percent black army. We became a new country, the first modern democracy, the United States of America. Dr. Riley, we have to call it a conversation right there. I encourage everyone to check out 1776 United. Sir, until our next conversation, thank you. Uh, where's your puppy? Uh, the dog, apparently, I mean, frankly, I shoot out into the front room. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, all right so animal, but it, it can't interfere with business and right. conversation. All right, we'll hold that cameo until our next get-together. Have a great day. You too, thanks. Dr. Wilford Riley, everybody.